it's crazy, but it's You're watching so Channel Z, the world's leading zombie apocalypse channel. It's something so broadcasting logical. live from Studio Z. Makes me act the way I do. And hello, everybody. Welcome to another Easter Monday episode of the Dr. Z Show here on Channel Z for a discussion of evolutionary medicine in the apocalypse. And as always, I am your host, Dr. Z, AKA Joe Alcock, MD. And I am an emergency physician uh, by day and sometimes night, and then aficionado of all things zombie and evolutionary uh, at all other times. And today we, we are gonna be joined, of course, uh, by our co-host and Channel Z originator, Athena Actipus. Hi, Athena. Hey, Dr. Z, how's it going today? Going good, I am excited. Um, are you ready for just like, you know, life, death, rebirth, and crazy blue blood? All the above. Those are yeah. that's a, a great way to uh, tee this off. So yeah, on this day of spring, we're going to be celebrating rebirth and also talking about the agent of death, endotoxin, with evolutionary immunologist and anthropologist Jessa, Jessica Brinkworth. Um, so maybe we should bring her into the uh, oh, yes. conversation. Hi. Hi, Jessica. <laughs> Good to see you guys. So, so what what do you know about blue blood? That was an interesting little uh, teaser Ooh. that Athena brought up a second ago. Yes, I wish I could say that it was like royal related, but it's um, the blood of the horseshoe crab uh, is blue, and the horseshoe crab is the um, organism that we use to make an assay to detect lipopolysaccharide or endotoxin. Endotoxin. So, Yes. That's, so, a, that's our agent of death. That's our agent of death. And so <laughs> horseshoe crabs have long been recognized as immediately identifying and being able to sequester this thing. And so we bleed them for the purposes of being able to uh, identify it ourselves on yeah. objects. Or you know what too, I really want to cool. see right now is a picture of that. What do you guys think? Should we see a picture of that? Sure. Let's see what we're talking about. Yeah. Now, this 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 is right out of a movie, right? This has got to be out of some kind of zombie movie, right? Yeah, yeah. it's got a very horrifying look to it. <laughs> it does. And, like, and what it, are those creatures? It is legitimately um, kind of ecologically horrifying anyway, because the way that this blood is like sequestered is that um, you know, these labs set up beside like oceanside and people come and collect these horseshoe crabs, they keep them in tanks and then they bleed them. And they bleed them from a tail, like a, from a tail bleed. They hold them up in those little brackets that you saw and they bleed them and then they throw them back into the ocean. Yeah. And a percentage of them die every time that they do that. So, yeah. So it's a, so it's it, a, big, it's a big industry, right? It's a huge industry. It's every drug that you take, every lab plastic, like uh, on the lab side, I think it's really easy to identify stuff that this is used for. Like it's used constantly, almost every reagent, almost every piece of plastic, anything that touches you surgically in a hospital other than like the like implements, any of those plastics, like it's used all the time. The irrigation water, like all of it. So why, Wait. why is it so important to test for this thing? And what is endotoxin? Why is it, what's, what's its importance? Well, it's a pyrogen. So one of the things that it does at minimum is that it can cause a fever in super, super low doses, but it actually can lead uh, in many organisms, humans included, um, it can lead to a really, really strong immune response, which is, uh, that can be quite dangerous and have lots of bystander tissue damage. So it's hypothetically, um, an agent of sepsis. That's right. And of course, sepsis is important in my job. Um, I worked in the ER last night and we had patients with sepsis. Oh. We do almost every day. And this endotoxin thing is, is kind of important in sepsis, isn't it? It is. It's used and has been for at least 40 years used as a, a model. Um, so you dose a mouse or you dose a human with a certain amount of it and you try to mimic the uh, the symptoms of sepsis with it. Uh, the thing is, is that to, to do that, you have to, for most organisms outside of humans, give them huge doses. And so whether or not the um, the symptoms that they mount when they're going into what would look like septic shock is actually septic shock or, or in yeah. any way indicative of what that would be in a human is, is questionable. And for our audience, let me just paint a picture. So patients will come in by ambulance, usually really sick. And the thing about sepsis usually is that you can look at a patient and they look sick, right? They are, you know, oftentimes their, their heart's kind of bounding 
Um, they're a little confused. Their vital signs are all messed up. Um, typically the heart rate's elevated, they're, they're breathing fast, they might have a fever, they usually do. Um, if they don't, that's actually a problem. <laughs> and their blood pressure, um, usually after a while, will go down. Uh, so they're, they're hypotensive. And yeah, we can get the doorway diagnosis. You're like, ooh, that patient's sick. And the nurse will come to me and say, hey, Dr. Zed, Dr. Alcock, go see that patient. They look, they look sick. Um, and it turns out this endotoxin is one of the things that can, um, that we thought was actually the cause of sepsis. If you, th if you think something's the cause of sepsis, then you might think it's good to get rid of it. But we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit later. But you brought up a really interesting thing, which is you, you mentioned um, other, other creatures, when they are exposed to endotoxin, they don't all respond in the exact same way. Well, so, can I just yeah. ask, like, what exactly is endotoxin? What are we, what are we talking? About I can't believe we skipped that. <laughs> I can't believe we skipped right over that. Yeah, we keep talking about this thing. <laughs> yeah, this thing this we thing. bleed crabs for it, and it causes sepsis and all this, all this nonsense. What, what are we talking about, Jessica? So, in this context, endotoxin is referring to lipopolysaccharide, which is a stabilizing component of the cell wall of gram-negative bacteria. So it yep. sits in the outer membrane and that's mainly its job is to, uh, as far as we know, is to stabilize the, the wall of that membrane. Well, it sounds like this is something I, I want to stay away from. So it's a good thing I don't have any endotoxin in my body, isn't it? Oh, you've got so much endotoxin Damn. though, Joe. It's everywhere. So that's <laughs> one of the things that's really interesting about it is it's absolutely pervasive. You are coated in it. It is in you, inside it out, and it's on every surface. It's literally Speak for there. yourself, Jessica. <laughs> <laughs> so, so then is it like something that our body detects as like, oh, there's something here that shouldn't be here? And then we respond to it, or does it like actually have mechanisms of action that are negatively affecting us? So we've we've evolved many many ways of finding it. Um, there are at least three receptor signaling pathways for it. There's large systems of immunity, um, the entire complement system, which is a series. Of, it's a ca it's a cascade of proteins that gets triggered by a bunch of things, including LPS, or that's the short form for lipopolysaccharide. Um, and then on top of that, there's a bunch of other enzymes that are engaged in just dis disassembling it. So there's lots of stuff that we've adapt uh, that we've evolved to um, to find it. That's how important it is. But it, it may have other effects. So to be clear, like there aren't there are some organisms that for some reason can't see it. But it's pretty. These adaptations are pretty ancient. Like plants have them, slime mold has them, we have them. So it's like across kingdoms of life, there are lots of organisms that can see it. So um, what Car Carla wants to know if it is a weapon or not. Like, is it just something that's there and we're responding to it, or is it actually doing damage to us? Well, this is controversial, right? I think if you pull most doctors in the hospital or in the intensive care unit, they're gonna say, "Oh, this is a weapon. This I is something am. that the the microbe is using to hurt us." Right, that's what they think. But what do you think? I also oh, I think it's useful for gram negative bacteria to have it because it stabilizes the cell wall. Uh, it's actually, and if you look at the guys that are on you all of the time, they tend to have a version of endotoxin that's ex, um, hexaacylated. So it has like six chemical chains on one end of it called acyl chains, and that happens to be the version that we can see most strongly. But the reason why that's beneficial, having those six chains, is because it makes for a much, much stronger cell wall. So it, it's um, something in which we're like in an arms race with to a certain extent. And then on top of that, we may also co-opt it for use. So so rolling back to, um, to whether or not it's bad, uh, you can take two to four four nanograms per kilogram before you might mount a response to it. So for so like every- how much, how much is that? Well, I don't know how much you weigh, <laughs> so, <laughs> but, a, a, but, a 60, but a 60 kilogram person could take about 180 nanograms. This is a pretty small amount, but 180 nanograms of this before they would start to mount a fever or show any symptoms of having been exposed okay. to it. Um, that's not the that's case. In, that's in your blood. That's it. Yeah, right. that's you have, direct more, you have way more than that in your colon because this is oh, part yeah. of E. coli, right? So you have yeah, two kinds yeah. of stuff. So when you're talking about these amounts, you're talking about if we were to inject it into your blood. Direct, stream. yeah. If you were to infuse it or inject it, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll interrupt just for one second to say that um, there was a 
I think it was a 1986 New England Journal paper, and it was by it was about a lab technician who I think it was a woman who tried to kill herself, and she had purified endotoxin um, from salmonella, and she injected it into her body, and it didn't actually have any live bacteria in it whatsoever. And this is how we learned that endotoxin can cause sepsis. It causes all the symptoms of sepsis without any live bacteria. And it was a pretty remarkable thing. It set off a 30 to 40 year old uh, project of trying to block endotoxin medically. And this is what we've done for decades since. And even fairly recently, there was a big trial. And again, most doctors think that if we block this, we can block sepsis and that's a good thing. But it turns out that all those trials and we're talking dozens and maybe about 10 very major ones published in things like the New England Journal, all these trials have failed to make people better. And so mm -hmm. that makes us think that, well, gosh, maybe, maybe it isn't really a weapon. Maybe it's something that alerts our immune system to badness and that yeah. really it's acting more like a hormone. I think you mentioned something about that, Jessica. Yeah, there's a there's a possibility that we co-opted as well. So first off, it does mm. alert us to badness. So the 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 adaptations in bacteria that would allow it to have like this hexaacylated conformation, this is something that is beneficial to us because we've adapted to see it. And so we can and therefore we can eliminate it. And if you inject someone with an LPS in these low doses, they'll get rid of it in about 30 minutes. We have such a robust, like undetectable, cannot find it anymore. Um, we have such a robust system in place to sequester it and get rid of it. It's it's usually gone right away if it's in, in blood in any case, yeah. which is one of the places where it's dangerous. But in the gut, uh, there's an indication that at least gram negative bacteria that's in the gut, which is coated with this stuff, it, ha it may have a protective effect against um, certain types of poisoning or mm -hmm. other kinds of toxins that are being yeah, released by their... Isn't it? Yeah. And yeah. Carlo Maley brings up a good point that the fact that we call it a toxin implies that it's a poison, but um, it hurts us maybe only because our immune systems are so sensitive to it and so primed to react really strongly to it. And they, it does, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. I think the other thing that's worth thinking about is that we may be super sensitive to it because it actually benefits us to be super sensitive. <laughs> super sensitive to it. It's a weird thing, a weird way of thinking, but like there's a thing that certain types of immune cells will do where they can become tolerant to it. And uh, and that what that means is that you can give them a little dose of LPS and then their responses to a subsequent much like huge pathologically high dose will be super blunted. They won't do very much. Um, and this is, you know, this is a well-known phenomenon. It's been explored for 80 or 90 years. And, um, the I guess no, it's more sixty years, but um, a long time. A long time. We've we've known yeah. about this for a long time. But one of the things that's really interesting about this is that it's all all of that is premised on the ability to detect it. So if that blunting effect is is beneficial, which is the way that we think about it, if you get an infection, the fact that you can induce tolerance in these white blood cells means that you might not end up with as much bystander tissue damage the bigger this infection gets then um, being extra sensitive to it might allow you to m mount this tolerant effect faster sooner. So yeah. there's other ways of thinking about it other than it being like just purely increased sensitivity right. to it as being bad or it itself as being is necessarily bad. And to that point that, that Carlo Mele is suggesting that, you know, we, we think of this as being a poison and it, it certainly can be. If you inject a bunch of this stuff in your body, it will kill you. Um, but it doesn't mean that it's always bad and that, Here's this kind of crazy co-evolutionary process that we've undergone uh, along with our m microbial house guests. Uh, it's important for us to know what they're doing and we have to detect them. We have things called toll-like receptors that allow us to do that. Um, and then yeah, uh, medical pharmaceutical companies have tried to block those receptors. And you think, oh, this is good if you block the, the interaction of the poison with the receptor that causes all the badness. But it turns out that when you do that, it doesn't necessarily make you better. I mean, it's kind of a silly notion if you think about it in the grander scheme of things. It's been around for billions of years. There are other yeah. organisms much older than us that have adapted to it. So why would you assume there's just one pathway? And that was the case until like 2012. Mm -hmm. We're like right up until 2012, we assumed there was just one pathway for blocking it. And that's one of the reasons I think also that those, those trials failed.
Right. Should, go ahead. should we look at that, the sort of cross species angle on this? Jessica, do you want to say a little bit about this? I'll pull up the picture. We should, oh, yeah, we should yeah. mention, and the reason why, you know, we have Jessica to lead us through this conversation is that she and um, a uh, colleague. My, yeah, Steve, my graduate student, Nagin Felicity. Um, yeah. So they wrote this paper entitled Sepsis and the Evolution of Human Increased Sensitivity to Lipopolysaccharide. AKA endotoxin. This is the love um, letter to endotoxin. Yeah. yeah, it really, it really is because again, the framing of this normally is that, Oh, this is, this is poison. This is bad. We need to block it. We need to do something. And then here you are saying something totally different. Aren't you, Jessica, you're saying that we're sensitive to it and maybe there's a good reason for that. Yeah, there's lots of, yeah, that's exactly it. Maybe there's a good reason for it. And beyond that, like there's so much that we just don't know and that it may be, you know, be beneficial overall. Yeah. So Jessica, what are we looking at on this? Oh, um, in this picture? Okay. Here. So yeah. I can take no credit for the actual drawings and stuff that are in here. So Nagin composed this, but what we're looking at um, from left to right is a, sort of an evolutionary tree of a bunch of organisms for which we have information on how sensitive they are to injections of lipopolysaccharide. And so at the far end, we've got a human, at the other end, we've got a chicken and a whole bunch of little critters in between. And then the levels required to trigger um, symptoms of sepsis are indicated by these gray bars. And you can kind of see that they're all over the map, but that humans are super, super, super low and rabbits are super, super, super low. So if you're super, super low, what does that mean? It means that very, very little can trigger symptoms of a minimum of fever and possibly sepsis. Okay. Let's go back to that figure for one second. Okay. Um, so we are more closely related to lemurs than we are, say, to dogs. That makes sense. Um, yeah. We don't really have any information on lemurs. So <laughs> we're more closely related to macaques, for example. Well, it's a good thing we put that lemur in. For, yeah, <laughs> we just, I don't know. I can't, I can't remember why we put him in there. I think it was because we were trying to make sure we looked like we had major branches of the primates covered. But excellent, yeah, excellent. so the macaque, which is uh, an Asian monkey, is closely related to us. It shares about 96% yeah. of our DNA, and it requires like... 10 times the dose to get the same responses. But anyway, we are, we're, we're special in this way um, compared to most other creatures. Most other creatures. Are. Yeah. We as a representative of apes, as far as we can tell, mm -hmm. there's only one other ape that's ever been tested and that's a chimpanzee and okay. they seem to be just as sensitive. All right. And what does that mean then for like us as humans that we're less sensitive? And what does that, that mean about sensitive. zombies? More sensitive, yeah. What, so does, what it does it mean, mean about zombies? zombies? Yeah, okay. zombies are derived from humans usually, right? Yeah, actually, I wanted to ask about that too, right? Because we think like zombies, oftentimes their immune systems are pretty compromised if they mm -hmm. are functioning at all. So, mm -hmm. what would uh, endotoxin response look like, or, or is that just not even a thing for zombies? I think we got to figure that zombies are at least mostly endotoxin. Yeah, I think they're kind of just oozing with the stuff at this right. point because they're in the process of decay. And a lot of the things that are going to be decaying, you will be facultative anaerobic. And a lot of those things will be gram negative bacteria. So they'll be carrying some kind of LPS. Yeah. Weren't we, weren't we talking in a recent episode about how zombies are Maybe it was not. A, maybe it wasn't a Doctor Z show. It was a conversation that, that zombies have little control over their um, excretory functions, so they must be just completely covered in, uh, in poop, <laughs> right, and feces, and thereby would be covered in endotoxin, both within and without. I well, never also, thought about that until this moment. It's got to be true. <laughs> it's gotta be true. Yeah. I also want to know though what this means for like zombie, you know, health and medicine, right? Like are like what kind of response are they having to the endotoxin that is all over them or not? Like, you know, is this an issue? Like Dr. Z, like if you were to have to take care of a a zombie, um, you know, what, what how would you deal differently with the issues with endotoxin? Right. Well, I think, you know, my my reading of uh Jessica's paper is that, you know, it is a love letter to endotoxin, but it's really a love letter to our immune system, right? We have this amazing immune system that does all kinds of terrific things and keeps us safe. Usually it can go, go awry and cause problems. Um, but we have this incredible way of detecting um, microbes and responding usually in ways that keep us safe. Um, zombies are going to lack that, right? They're not going to have the capacity to mount any kind of defense against microorganisms. And so they are thoroughly hijacked, right? So that's the whole idea behind sort of the biological um, you know, concept of zombification by other organisms. So they, in a way, they don't have an immune system or their immune system has been completely co-opted co um, 
by these microbes. That's my take, but you guys might have a different take on it. I, I think, so I would, uh, I would agree. I think that's actually a pretty solid take on it. Um, yeah, I would agree. I was gonna step back for a minute uh, and say we were talking about benefits and I wanna make sure I get this one out is that, you know, for vaccines to work, they usually need something called an adjuvant, which would help attract early, uh, immune cells to the location to like pick up the thing that you're injecting to mount this adaptive response so that you have immune memory and the vaccine works. And that has often been LPS. So there's other ones that are that are uh, chemically made now, but a lot of the early vaccines use lipopolysaccharide as a, as a way of doing this. So we use it like on purpose for our own benefit. Um, because so. it puts the immune system on high alert. Yeah, it brings that's a good, good thing for a vaccine. I very mean, we, good thing. Again, there should be no endotoxin in, say, the COVID nineteen vaccines. No, there's that, none. That's not, yeah, that's really interesting. That I, to my, I've read through all of them. To my knowledge, none of them have an adjuvant of any kind engaged. Yeah, well, because so. that spike protein is enough of a. Yeah, so that's, <laughs> it causes such a crazy reaction. You don't need endotoxin to make it even worse. Enough of a message that something <laughs> is going wrong. <laughs> so, well, in the case of how the immune system interprets it, right? You get the vaccine, yeah. that's a good thing. So, yeah. And Athena is muted, but I'm gonna read I'm gonna read this. Um, yeah, I'm back, but I, I just wanted back. to pull this up because I think it's a great question. It is a great question. Um, of course, I have some ideas about this. And the question is from Carlo Maley. If interfering with endotoxin doesn't work with for sepsis, that's been shown by these massive clinical trials, what option do we have to prevent sepsis from killing people? Um, I have some ideas, but I'm curious what, yeah, what you think. So I have a bunch of different ideas about this. So the first thing I think that's really uh, misleading about LPS as a cause of sepsis is that bacteria does cause a lot of sepsis cases. Most things that will, you know, cause sepsis tend to live on you. And most of those things that we are able to identify in any case, and we are unable to identify over 40% of of cases go without us being able to identify a causative pathogen. So that's mm. something to keep in mind in the first place. There's a bunch of unknowns, but for most of those, it's usually a gram negative or a gram positive bacteria. So things, either things with LPS or things with no LPS, but flu can cause it. And if you go to different places in the world, different things cause it. So malaria is a leading cause of it in sub-Saharan Africa. It, it depends on where you go. There's fungi, you know, there's lots of different things that can cause it. So just targeting LPS is saying, okay, well, maybe I'll take 50% of what I can identify and say that this is the thing I'm going to try to block. But I think the thing right now for how things, <laughs> that the situation is really prevention and it's prevention on a much grander scale than the way that we tend to think about prevention. So it's not just wound cleaning and um, getting your flu shot annually. It's trying to reduce comorbidities years out. It, it, we, it, sorry. Yeah, can we talk for a second about wound cleaning? Because yeah. I was listening to, this is something I was thinking about yesterday. I was listening to a book and, they're, and the, they were describing how they were going to take care of a very terrible wound that, that, could cause like sepsis. And they're like, yeah, they were dabbing it with hydrogen peroxide, putting a little neosporin on it. I'm like, no, people, really, if you have a wound, especially a contaminated wound, soap and water, high volumes of water, like put it under the tap or the hose or just wash it out. The more water you move through the wound, the better off you are. And right. you want the water to, it doesn't have to be sterile per se, um, but if you were worried about the water quality, you could boil it first. Um, but this idea of dabbing it with hydrogen peroxide, it's not gonna work. Yeah, anytime that I've had a lab accident, I actually had a lab accident once, this is now over 10 years ago, where I stabbed myself with a needle that I was just about to Oof. put into a bottle of lipopolysaccharide, mm. and I slipped and it stabbed me and said I ended up with like an itty bitty bit of compartment syndrome. So this was the first time that I had learned that like squeezing is the... It had never come up in training before then. What like is the squeezing compartment the thing. syndrome? Oh, it's when you end up with fluid accumulating between two pieces of fascia. I've got this right, right? Two pieces of fascia. So that it's, right. you should say this. This is your well, job. You do have little parts of your body that are bounded by connective tissue. So they can't really expand. Um, and so we call them compartments. And you have some in, in your limbs. And the, you have a blood pressure, right? So... You, your blood requires a certain amount of pressure to, to get blood and oxygen to all your parts of the body. If the pressure in that compartment exceeds your blood pressure, then you're in trouble. And all those little cells and tissues die and they become, you know, necrotic. That's right. bad. So it, what I had was blood that was accumulating inside the tip of my finger, which sounds kind of ridiculous, but I was, so I had to squeeze it to get it out. And we'd never done that in bloodborne pathogen training in any of the lab training I had done. 
Uh, and it turns out that this is a standard thing to do, that the bleeding is the thing. Like if you have a small wound and you're worried about the infection, the bleeding is the thing that you do to get it out. Yep. And then it's about irrigation. Yeah, I agree. I think that that's, uh, it's fascinating that they're dabbing it with hydrogen peroxide sounds terrible. Yeah, and maybe just a tiny bit more just about sepsis. Um, the reason why this is so important, it's one of the leading killers of patients in the hospital. I bet that COVID probably exceeded sepsis um, oh, yeah. for My some period during this last year. Yeah, so but there's about 700 and, well, okay, so this number's been adjusted. There's one point, around 1.5 million cases of sepsis in the U.S. every year, and it kills adjusted numbers somewhere around 700,000 or something now, right? It, it's low anyway. Uh, compared, yeah. Compared the number I have here, this is out of date. It's almost six years out of date. 60,000 deaths yearly in um, in the U.S. But I've seen numbers higher than that. Yeah. It's, it is a moving target. It is. It is. And this was based on a, the numbers I'm giving are based on a paper by Rudd 2019, which is, uh, it uses a different method for trying to find all these cases. So it's, yeah possible that it's off too but um and it hasn't been replicated so there's there's that but yeah there's quite a few cases and there are quite a few deaths and we right now are well over half a million covid deaths all right so i don't think we alone. ever we ever meant and answered carlo's question which is how do we treat it if we if we shouldn't necessarily oh, just focus on endotoxin i did i just said you? you have to spend decades in prevention <laughs> yeah right. it's decades in prevention right in terms of what they do in the hospital you would be a much better person to say this i would say the best you can offer is support right yeah, i mean it, so uh, we have a few right. questions from the audience here too, just to make sure, you know, Liz was pointing out that we need bloodborne pathogen training and Pam wants to know, should you actually squeeze a wound mm. if you think that you might have an infection? Just make sure that we get the sort of, you know, zombie apocalypse prep um, information all straight here. Okay. If you're, suppose you're um, bitten by a rabid bat. All right. You're in big trouble and you need to get, um, you know, the anti rabies, um, anti-venom immediately. Uh, but that's a situation in which actually if you were, if you had a wound on a finger, squeezing it out might be, might make sense. The same is probably true for certain kinds of snake bites. Um, but in general, um, we don't recommend that um, for, for the vast majority of wounds, squeezing, et cetera, is not part of the, you're just going to, you're going to worsen the tissue damage and make things worse. But there will be some, some very limited cases in which that's a good idea. Yeah, my only reason for ever having done this is because I cut myself on something in the lab, which has happened um, a few times, mm -hmm. though not in the yeah. last like 10 years. Yeah. All right. So now um, Carlo's asking what to prevent sepsis deaths if, uh, you know, interfering with endotoxin is not really an option. I mean, if you know what the causative organism is, and Jessica, you mentioned that sometimes we don't, um, then giving somebody the, an antibiotic that's going to cover that microbe can be curative and doing it in a timely fashion makes a, a lot of sense. Um, I think, you know, it's a complicated thing. This is a, this is a nut that we've not cracked. We've not figured out how to treat sepsis over the 30 or 40 year period of, of studying it. And most of our interventions have been aimed at, at tamping down the immune system at making our bodies less reactive um, in ways that have not helped us, but there may be more sophisticated things we can do. Um, perhaps inducing tolerance by other other ways, uh, and also just recognizing that endotoxin isn't always bad. Um, the last thing I wanted to bring up is that um, there's work by, uh, I think Tom McDade and Chris Kazawa done in the Philippines showing that um, kids raised in a high endotoxin environment, um, it doesn't necessarily make them sicker. That in some ways they do better with cardiovascular disease later on in life. So it's complicated. This is a very, very complicated thing. And that's the idea. So, but an evolutionary point of view, like what uh, Dr. Brinkworth has been describing is, is the way to go to understand how this is all working. Does this relate to the hygiene hypothesis? Well, it does. That's that, that, that finding that I just described to you is part of that hygiene hypothesis, that the idea that our bodies are, we're too protected from microbes in some ways, and that can increase our risk for things like um, asthma and, and autoimmune diseases. And in that paper, there was some suggestion that it, that if we're too sequestered from endotoxin early in life, that that can actually maybe cause bad things with regard to heart disease. It's true. There's two sides to it, though, too, right? Like it's about the development yeah. and, and the developmental exposures because LPS is used as an asthma trigger deliberately in experimentation. Yeah. So like, uh, uh, yeah. So yeah. But if you're exposed early on, then maybe you develop, you know, maybe you reprogram and develop 
tolerance to it overall, and it's not as, as big of a thing. The agent of death is complicated. It's very complicated and so amazing. I mean, the overall, just like the the evolution of how we've responded to it and how um, and how it's potentially changed to like compete with us is just an absolutely beautiful thing. I am absolutely fascinated and in love with this whole phenomenon well, maybe, between us and it. So. Maybe we'll have to bring you back for another discussion. We should talk about uh, strategies for health, um, avoiding zombification, mm -hmm. uh, keeping ourselves from getting sick. Um, with regard to endotoxin, inflammation, and other stuff, uh, maybe for a later episode. Sure thing. Anytime. Jessica, thank you so much for coming yeah. on. Thanks for having me. A truly enlightening and apocalyptic <laughs> conversation, as always. Yeah, thanks. Well, great. Well, well, that was amazing. Dr. Zed, I learned so much about endotoxin from you and Dr. Brinkworth. Well, we could go on all, all day, but we're not going to. So yeah, so this this wraps up another episode of the Dr. Zed Show. Um, thank you for, for joining us for, for this time where we had a, a great conversation with a true expert, um, Jessica Brinkworth, on this topic. Uh, so please join us again for, for our next episode and, and stay tuned. Thanks. Crazy, but it seems so logical. I can't deny that there is something supernatural with you.